Hello everyone and hello to my students in ethics and critical thinking classes. Once again, this is your professor, Dr. Ilan, and I welcome you to this philosophy lecture series. This is the continuation of lesson two with the topic, the undefinability and definability of philosophy. Under the wider heading, the what and the why, a philosophy. Now we go on to the uh, more serious, very actually very serious uh, uh, discussion with regard to the definition of philosophy. So we will encounter the more scientific definition. All right. So this number three makes our discussion, you know, uh, more boring perhaps because it gets more objective and gets more serious. But this is the, the essential one no, that we need to understand with regard to philosophy. Okay, so number three, technical definition. Technical sense, thesis number one, and let me read the definition. Philosophy is the science of all things or beings. Uh, maybe later on, you will discover that when you say all things, that is synonymous to being. Things and beings are synonymous terminologies in philosophy. They are simply the same. All right? Through their first causes under the light of natural reason. You see, the definition of philosophy here is so short so precise but loaded no with meanings uh, meanings that are not readily understandable to ordinary people so it needs uh, clarification all right so but don't worry because uh, we will uh, explain those highlighted word or phrases uh, one after the other Number one, philosophy is a science. Uh, so philosophy is a science. Uh, our keyword, by the way, is the word science. So philosophy is a science because it is a systematized body of knowledge. So uh, on the following discuss discussions, you will discover that the, the object of philosophy is everything that exists. So it may follow and you may comment perhaps that if that is the case then philosophy must be a disorganized body of knowledge but this definition tells us the other way around because philosophy actually is a systematized body of knowledge therefore it is a science now let me give you some examples so you can accommodate that idea uh, maybe one of the examples that can be given is the guitar and the actual playing of the guitar. No? Uh, maybe in some places, uh, the playing of guitar is not scientific, no? especially those people who are not relying on the scientific processes of playing a guitar. When I say scientific processes, uh, you're following the, the notes, the chord, the rhythm, and the proper way of strumming the guitar. And there, there is a study about it. So if you follow that step-by-step -step process, then you say that uh, playing the guitar is a science. All right? Another example would be uh, culinary. I think culinary is uh, an art, an art of preparing <coughs> and cooking food. So long, long time ago, I hope you can agree with me, that cooking is not a science. No? especially when people during that time are cooking a uh, vegetable so they don't know which vegetable is easier easier to cook and harder to cook so they and they put everything but nowadays because of study no? so we know which is the one to be put first no and then the second one and so on and so forth so we can have a well well prepared uh, cook food, all right. 
So there is an art in it. So that way, if you if you apply a step by step procedure in cooking, then you say that cooking is a science. Okay. Now number two, philosophy is knowledge of all things. Uh, philosophy encompasses everything. No, that is one thing that you can learn about philosophy because in philosophy we can talk about just anything it deals with the wide scope of study anything that exists look at that picture that I used as an example here and I want you to imagine so so critically I am inviting you to to feel you know, the 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 picture everything that you can see so it it uh, presents variety of existing things no? the grass the mountains the rocks the stones everything everything under the sun including the sun so everything practically everything that exists no? is the concern of philosophy and everything that exists is a being all right so whether that thing is a small very tiny object but as long as it is existing then it is a being and that is a concern of philosophy so whether it is small or big whether you see it or you don't see it as long as it exists it is a being now i think a good example for that is god now you don't see god right Unfortunately, that is the most obvious uh, uh, reason why people don't believe in God. They don't see God. But you know that uh, it's non sequitur. It does not follow that because you don't see, there is none in existence. Because uh, our naked eye is not the sole determinant no? to say that a thing is existing or not existing. All right? So let me proceed to number three. Sorry. Number three. Through their first causes. Philosophy is concerned about or concerned with the essential or the ultimate causes. Meaning it, it is beyond the tangible and the observable realities. So as mentioned, first cause means ultimate cause. And philosophy is more concerned about the explanation of, uh, uh, of the uh, the explanation or of the essences of the things around us. So philosophy is more concerned about uh, the essences of the things rather than the existing things themselves. All right. So the focus of philosophy is not on the factual real realities that are found in this world but it's more concerned on the beyond of this world no? in the realm of the no of the ultimate causes in the realm of the ideas all right now number four uh, is very interesting in the sense that you have something to understood about it under the light of natural reason so philosophy is distinguished from theology okay for using reason alone well the latter uses reason but it should be illumined by faith so that is theology well theology is not using faith alone that faith must be supported by reason so that that faith should not become a blind faith no? so your faith must be a reasonable faith all right uh, now but what I need to emphasize here in this um, subtopic is the word natural reason. To say natural reason is to also understand its opposite, which is supernatural reason. And the, the, the word, the important word is super. So when you say super, no, that is a Latin word, and the translation of that is above. Okay? And then natural to mean nature so the translation of supernatural 
is above nature. So it's a kind of explanation about the worldly things, about the worldly events, through the use of the supernatural reason. Okay, now what is the background of that? Because we are saying now that in philosophy, we have to use the natural reason. And to say natural, right, is to mean nature. That is why philosophy becomes science, no? or scientific. It is, uh, it is based on nature. Alright? Now, so what does it mean? So we can remember what happened in the history of philosophy. That, because, that before uh, philosophy uh, existed, or before philosophy was born no? in the history, what was existing prior to that was mythology. Alright? Well, I hope you're familiar with mythology. Well, in the first place, uh, is mythology true? Well, we know that from the very word itself, myth, no, it is not true. But if it is not true, why are we studying mythology? Okay, that is, uh, that is I think, uh, a, a, a kind of question where you, you have to use critical thinking. Why? Why do you have to use it? Why do you have to study it? Well, maybe one of the reasons is simply to appreciate literature. That's one. But for our own concern in philosophy, uh, mythology is important because we uh, because and because of that we we can understand the reason for the coming of philosophy. All right. Remember that um, philosophy came. Because it was a re uh, philosophy came to us simply as a reaction to mythology. So there was a point among the Greeks that they did not uh, trust anymore mythology. No? So they did not believe anymore in, in, the, in the processes of mythology. And so what happened was they started to, to think the new way they started to, to, to have a new belief system. Alright? And that, start, that was started um, by one of the pre-Socratic philosophers, Thales. No? Because he was the first one to observe the world no? with his astonishing uh, primary questions. No? Those first questions in philosophy was said by or was asked by Thales. And Thales was so, the so-called first cosmologist. He was the first cosmologist because he was the first one to be concerned about the workings of nature. And that was the start of philosophy. That way, we can say that from then on, philosophy became a science. Alright? So, uh, to understand now, uh, philosophy is not to apply supernatural reason unlike before during the mythology age during the age, uh, ancient period wherein uh, through the gods and goddesses of uh, the Greeks they were explaining the worldly events no? connecting to the activities of the gods and goddesses now, for example uh, uh, they would explain a good harvest because it is influenced by a certain goddess no? um, which is um, I mean in relation to to the to the crops and so on and so forth and those well we know sci scientifically speaking when we say supernatural explanation that is baseless no? in the same way that uh, I mean th in the same way that we understand what superstitious belief is and superstitious belief of course is baseless no? for example no? don't sweep the floor at night because you will meet bad luck well that is an example of superstitious belief and we know that scientifically speaking it is baseless no? it is simply a supernatural explanation Supernatural. Well, we can remember Superman, our idol. But take note that Superman 
is just a fiction. He is a re uh, he is not a reality because there is no such thing as that. Therefore, in philosophy, I mean, for you to understand philosophy, uh, you simply need to employ natural reason, as simple as that. Your natural reason is sufficient for you to understand philosophy. Okay, let us proceed. Number four, technical definition. Technical sense, thesis number two. So this one is not another definition class. This one is not another definition, but a support no? uh, to the previous definition provided. So this is uh, so this this is just uh, a follow up for that definition that was already provided, and it says these notions imply that philosophy is a is a human and therefore also a social activity, which consists in man's perennial and disinterested search for the intel intelligible structure of the totality totality of being wow so loaded no? uh, it seems uh, an ordinary understanding uh, cannot uh, fathom what this statement is talking about but as usual don't worry because we shall address the highlighted word or phrases no? in a step by step explanation okay but before we uh, uh, explain point number one I would like to introduce to you the so-called schema of philosophical studies because uh, this will help us uh, explain in detail the coming uh, details no? minute details of definition of philosophy Okay, so this schema will help us explain clearly the details of thesis number two. So you see here being. Uh, uh, and being, in short, is understood as existence. We shall have a discussion on that on the following lecture. So watch that out uh, because that is, uh, is going to be so interesting. Uh, and... Uh, so if, be, if the word being, if the concept being means existence, and if being, you see here, being, being on top of this diagram, and if this being serves as the object of philosophy, then philosophy is concerned with the totality of all beings in the universe, including the universe. So this diagram shows us the totality of being which is the concern of philosophy. Uh, there, uh, I will devote um, a special discussion for this diagram. Don't worry. But uh, what I need to emphasize at this moment is that field of study, ontology. By the way, the word ontos means being. So the study of all beings in general is called ontology. Okay, so all these things, all the things that are included here, no? in organic beings, plants, animals, man, angels, God, and everything, uh, those are the concern of philosophy. So that is the first point that we need to understand here. The second point that I would like to emphasize is man. No? Man being the center of philosophy here. All right? So I hope you get it. So it is emphasized here. Man is at the center. So it tells us so much about uh, man being the only one who philosophizes because that is the, the direction of our discussion in the coming slides. No? Man is the only kind of being who philosophizes. Who philosophizes. So it is not... So the... The inorgan inorganic beings, the inanimate beings are not philosophizing. The plants, of course, are not philosophizing. Animals are not philosophizing. Angels are not philosophizing. God is not philosophizing. 
but it is only man who philosophizes. And then you may ask at this point, what is the main reason for that? And I have already answered for that question. And the reason is because man has many problems. And man is the most problematic being in this world. And that gives us the reason why man needs to philosophize. Alright, so I will give you more um, explanation for that. Okay, this one. Number one, philosophy is a human activity. So philosophy is for man alone. Only man philosophizes. What about the inanimate objects? And let's see the examples here. This is an example of inanimate object, a non-living thing, a stone. Do you think it can philosophize? So one day, you stumble upon a rock and you found it talking to you. <laughs> that is horrible. So if you experience that, ah, maybe you have to go to your psychiatrist. Maybe there's something wrong with you. It is not the problem of the stone, but maybe it is your problem. Okay, because precisely the stone cannot philosophize. What about the, uh, the plants, the flowers? Now, your flower, your rose flower, when you, when you go home, you notice that your flower is speaking to you. Wow. Then you have to slap your face. No? Because that's, that should not happen. And again, uh, maybe something is happening to you. All right? <laughs> Then your dog, and maybe you would say, wow, uh, there's a possibility uh, because now a do uh, this kind of being is a living thing. But can a dog philosophize? Well, in the previous discussion, the previous lesson, I told you that your dog has no problem. If, it, if, if you find it uh, making noise and it, because it is hungry, your dog has no problem at all. You are the one having the problem. All right? So, animals cannot philosophize. They may seem communicating to us because they can look at us, but precisely, they cannot philosophize. Their, their, the complexity of their, or the cap capability of their mind is not sufficient to handle you know, the, the processes of philosophizing. So, obviously, it is highlighted here that only man philosophizes. Only man. But let us uh, go beyond man. What about the spiritual beings? Like angels. Can an angel philosophize? I'd like to give you a few seconds to think and answer my question. Can an angel philosophize? What do you think? And notice my question, can an angel philosophize? Alright? Well, that is a very tricky question. To ask whether an angel can philosophize, the answer of course is yes. But if the answer, if the question is, does the angel need to philosophize? Then our answer is no. And for that reason, the angel is not philosophizing. The angel is not philosophizing because the angel does not need it. Why? Because the angel has no problem. Do you get it? Okay. Uh, for you to accommodate that example, I would like you to imagine that uh, we, ha we are in an actual classroom. The pandemic is over and we are already in our uh, actual classroom. So we are inside our classroom and there is a wall dividing our classroom from the other classroom okay so you are focusing on the wall now my question to you is do you know exactly what is happening beyond the wall well you may say well sir I know what's happening beyond this wall because I know there is a professor there there are students and they are conducting a class well that is not my concern what I'm asking you is do you know exactly every detail that is happening there and then you, you say no, of course. And if you say no, that's the big problem of your life. And in fact, there are many things 
of course, that we don't know. So we have problem. And humans have a lot of problem. Okay? Because uh, in the case of the angel, because the angel has no physical aspect. The angel has no body. No? Remember, I think one of the sources of our problem in this world is because of our body. No? For instance, you would like to go to the U.S., but you cannot just go there no? because you have to undergo processes. But if, you're, if you don't have a body, you're like an angel. No? At, a blink of your, at a blink of your eye, you're there. All right? So you don't have problem. Now going back, uh, you focus on the wall. So the angel, because the angel has no material body, so the angel can simply pass through the wall. Zoom. And the, and the angel is already there in the other class. And the angel, the angel sees what exactly is going on. So the angel has no problem. Well, for now, that is uh, our uh, explanation why the, why the angels are not philosophizing. All right? Then finally, what about God? Can God philosophize? Wow. Great question. Of course, because God is the source of all understanding. God is omniscient. He is all-powerful. But the question, does God need to philosophize? And then our answer is no. Because God does not need it. Because God knows everything. Alright? And so, as our final conclusion, only man philosophizes. Well, as, as, as my student, I would like you to uh, understand that explanation. Maybe in one of the recitations, I can call you and uh, you explain orally that way in a in a convincing uh, way of explanation all right so let us proceed number two philosophy is a social activity among all the among the, the many aspects of the definition of philosophy i think this one is so easy to understand this communicates to us very well no? because we are a social being it follows that uh, uh, philosophy belongs to man and because he's a social being we say no man lives for himself or herself alone no? we have a saying no man is an island so whether it is figurative or literal I think it is not possible and it should not be because by nature according to the way a human person is designed by the creator from the beginning, you are a social being, and you are not supposed to be. Um, you're not supposed to be alone. You're not so be. You're not supposed to be antisocial, because you are a social being. You're supposed to be in constant interaction with other human beings. All right. Next. Number three, philosophy is a perennial activity. Uh, the key word here is the word perennial, which literally means in the making, all right? So try to understand very well. Perennial means it is always in the making, never ending. No, That's uh, how we understand the word or the term perennial is. And philosophy is like that. So philosophy is a never ending task. It goes on and on. There is no stopping in philosophy as long as there are people, individuals, who are thinking normally, philosophy exists. So philosophy is a science in the making, a never-ending task, not limited by time, as long as there is man who thinks, who thinks it remains. So you can imagine the world... Uh, uh, experience a great catastrophe knock on the wall may it not happen but suppose it happens and uh, at the end of that uh, traumatic experience no 
uh, there is only one person left who survived and that is you and you are left on an island alone and you're you can still thinking no? properly so we can say that philosophy remains but when time comes that you become insane because you're all alone in that island with only one coconut tree and one buko remains <laughs> no so and then and then finally you become insane because there is nobody to talk to but to yourself then i guess philosophy stops okay you get it so as long as people are thinking normally and properly philosophy is there so it is a never ending task uh, we can accommodate the idea of co-terminus no? so philosophy and man are co-terminus as long as man is existing philosophy is existing all right number four philosophy is a disinterested knowledge all right so my big concern here is the term disinterested now it sounds negative now when we say philosophy is a disinterested knowledge you may have now uh, an understanding that philosophy is a boring thing parang it is now justified your own uh, assumption that philosophy is boring okay so that's what you're thinking because philosophy is disinterested but i tell you that is not the way we interpret that specific terminology because in this discussion it has its own operational definition because here to say disinterested means philosophy is not motivated by practical reason hey guys let me remind you again and again that is the way we understand the word disinterested it is not motivated by practical reason but if you did not lis listen to this discussion and you insist and you answered in one of the major exams no you gave an answer to the question why philosophy is disinterested and you wrote you right because philosophy is boring then I will deduct 200 points from you so nothing is left for you <laughs> you get it okay well I am exaggerating but the point is please study uh, or try to understand the way uh, that terminology is being explained here uh, but what actually is practical reason what is the most practical reason in this world i have there a clue all right so this is the most practical thing in the in the world money everything is money according to you and according to many people but uh, in uh, from from the point of view of philosophy well money is not everything actually money is nothing in philosophy because in philosophy there is no money involved wala kang mapapala pag nag-aral ka ng uh, filosofiya wala lang nagkataon lang na pwede palang ituro ang philosophy no? and I am earning money for teaching you philosophy but by studying and pra practicing applying to your life philosophy itself you'd never earn money for that maybe when you when you get promoted someday uh, because you applied some uh, uh, principles of philosophy you applied and then y you had uh, a wonderful behavior in the workplace so you, you got promoted and therefore uh, you paid um, high for that uh, attainment of yours but here there is no money in philosophy because what is only emphasized here in philosophy is that philosophy is just a quest for the sake of knowledge or truth no it is not about material things but it's simply the love or the passion for knowledge and that is what 
that is what is being personified by Philo, our friend here. Hey Philo, how are you there? So we are talking about you right now. So that is Philo, the passion. He represents the passion, our passion. It's like the passion for everything. If you are a painter, then you have a passion for your, for, for your art. No? And for example, a teacher like me. So you can express it, express it this way. When I teach, I teach. That is passion. That is an expression of my love for my profession, teaching. And then as student maybe, in your case, so when you study, you study. And that is the passion. That is the love that philosophy is talking about. And that is philo. Alright? So it is not about money, but simply for the purpose of seeking wisdom. Alright? And we are now talking about the partner of philo here, Sophie, Sophia, who personifies wisdom. Okay, I hope all of you uh, understand uh, this explanation. Let's proceed now. Number five, philosophy is intelligible because philosophy uses reason and it studies only the things which are comprehensible. Meaning to say, philosophy is not concerned with anything that goes beyond our human comprehension. It is not interested about things that are unfathomable. For example, mystery. No? In the previous lesson, I also talked about that. Philosophy shy away from mystery because in the first place, philosophy cannot approach it. And in fact, philosophy does not use mystery so that uh, it can solve a problem in this complicated world. But as I told you, philosophy uses another term, paradox. Because paradox is a kind of tool that can help us solve many problems in this paradoxical world. Alright? Now, I want to give you an example of sort of a mystery, okay? Which uh, philosophy is not concerned anymore, alright? It may attempt, why not? But uh, when it finds that it cannot proceed, then philosophy, philosophy stops there. Let me give you an example. This one. Can three become one? Do you hear me? Can three become one? Of course, it is illogical. It goes against the principle of mathematics. Three, of course, is not one. So it is illogical. But I think there are instances when it is true also. Like for instance, uh, coffee, three in one. Diba? A coffee is three in one. So it accommodates that uh, thinking. What, what else can be an example? When you consider an egg, no? An egg. When you uh, when you try to examine the the nature of an egg, then you then you can discover that it is three in one. No? It means you can find three characteristics, but you have only one egg as its uh, essence or nature. Yeah, right? Do you get it? So three aspects um, composing one nature, which is the egg. I think that is quite. Uh, understandable now but to say uh, three in one in terms of a doctrine of a religion for example the Catholic Church having a doctrine there are three persons in one God oh that is so hard to to understand in fact not all people are readily agreeing to that doctrine that there are three persons in one God simply because that goes beyond logic it is very illogical well well, God goes beyond logic. No? I think the, the kingdom of God uh, is far beyond human logic. Anyway, so philosophy 
uh, is not spending so much time although it helps it helps theology in trying to understand uh, that theological uh, aspect of faith the theological revelation okay so philosophy is not an enemy by the way of theology you will see that in the coming discussion so philosophy is a help for theology to understand more its faith but the role of philosophy uh, is only uh, up to the to its own limitation if it cannot explain anymore about that subject matter then it, it stops there all right because uh, philosophy believes that man has another faculty to use not only the faculty of wonder not only the faculty of reason but the faculty of faith so that is why here uh, at this juncture you can remember one of the greatest uh, philosopher theologian a synthesizer between philosophy and theology and that is none other than Thomas Aquinas no? uh, and he's famous for the saying when reason ends faith begins the death of your reason is the beginning of your faith because as humans our our mind has limitation and there is a, a constant reminder I think by psychology that you have to be careful because there is a very thin dividing line you know, between sanity and insanity if you push too much your mind into thinking about the things that are beyond your capacity to comprehend there's a possibility that you'll become insane and the line is so thin like a piece of hair so at the moment you know you're sane but maybe after a second you're insane already and that is the danger so don't go beyond no the dictate of your nature as a human being we are just as we are we are simply a limited creatures in this world our mind is not that that powerful to understand everything that is the reality that is why uh, there must be uh, faith although uh, very unfortunately not all people have faith and not all pe people realizing that they don't have faith um, are attempting to to ask you know to to pray that they be given that they be gifted a faith all right that is one of the uh, problems and issues between uh, philosophy and philosophy of religion okay so before I transfer to the next uh, slide so we have here mystery versus paradox uh, I would like to reiterate that we are more interested about the paradox in philosophy because that helps us uh, in solving our human problem mystery is not helping us well now if you say that God is mystery which I tend to, to agree with you okay uh, <clears throat> yeah that is correct we can say that God is a mis is, is a mystery and there is no way that we can understand God whatever we do we cannot define God and that is what we learned from the previous discussion and so to approach God is simply to have faith all right no more explanation we must have faith however uh, Thomas Aquinas is uh, is is providing uh, a step forward knowing that not all people are having faith uh, his solution is to offer his the so-called quinque vie no? the, or the five ways of Thomas Aquinas of proving the existence of God uh, by using uh, reason alone by using the philosophical argument to prove that even if you don't have faith at least by the use of your reason you can prove you can be convinced that there is God unfortunately again whether uh, you uh, whether we have that uh, cosmological proof of Thomas Aquinas no and faith still there are people 
who do not believe in God. They remain uh, atheist or agnostic. And related to that, there are countries, in fact, there are many countries in the world uh, who, who uh, there are many countries uh, with people not believing in God. So sad. All right? So sad, but we, of course, we, we respect those people. All right? Number six. Philosophy is a totality of being. So, this, uh, this one is emphasized already in the schema of philosophical studies that I have shown you at the onset of this uh, subtopic. Uh, philosophy is about the totality of being. Philosophy studies everything that has existence both in the mind and in reality. So our focus in this subtopic is about existence. And there are two kinds of existence. One is the so-called mental existence and the other one is the real existence. Mental existence is to accommodate you know, kinds of things that can exist only in the mind. And the good examples for that uh, are the mythical figures no? for example the um, unicorn I hope you know what unicorn is it's a kind of animal with one horn on the forehead <laughs> sorry I am uh, I am cracking a joke I am kidding so it is not horn you do not see one horn erected on the forehead of the of the unicorn <laughs> because it is unicorn but it is a horn but I guess it is not in existence yet. So it remains a mythical figure. So it is not true. But I have a question. Is unicorn existing? What do you think? Is it existing? And our answer is definitely yes. Now unicorn is existing. But only in our mind. It is existing only in our mind. No? Because the moment we are thinking about the unicorn in our mind, it, it, it exists there. But after we forgot the unicorn in our mind, then it stops to exist. Alright? Now, uh, instead of indicating here uh, unicorn, I indicated Pegasus. See that? Well, this is only for the sake of uh, uniformity because I am talking here about horse with wings. No? Of course, horse with wing is another kind of mythical figure which is not existing in reality. Okay? This is so cute. And, and then, as an example for the, for the thing that is existing in reality, I have provided this another thing an existing thing but having wings so this is napkin with wings at least they are the same all right so you cannot doubt that napkin with wings has a real existence now to add to the uh, by the way uh, i will have i will have you watch uh, that explanation of the coming uh, discussion coming lesson I will have uh, a thorough discussion about this aspect, about the two kinds of existence. Um, uh, but what I would like to emphasize at this point is that if you say mental existence, then our mind has a control over it. So your mind can decide whether you, you want to think about that mythical figure or not. So your mind has a control over it. But with, reg but with regard to the real existence, your, our mind cannot control. So whether you, we think or we don't think about anything that is existing around us, no, we cannot affect its, its existence. No? We call it extra mental. So uh, I would like to grab the opportunity to, to mention it at this point. Uh, the case of the existence of God. Well, well, God is not simply uh, an idea created by our mind because we believe that God has an objective existence and for that reason, uh, God has a real existence. 
So our mind has no control of the existence of God. So whether you believe or you don't believe, and whether you think of God as an existing being or not, the existence of God per se as an objective being is not affected. Alright? So I will have detailed uh, discussion for that on the next lessons. Let me proceed now. Number five. Now let's try to uh, to do or to apply another way of defining and that is through comparative approach. So here we are comparing uh, physical sciences because we learned that philosophy is a science also but let us compare philosophy with other sciences. So philosophy and physical sciences um, are different from each other. Okay, look at this. So physical sciences are studying their objects piece by piece or part by part. I think uh, a good example of a physical science is anatomy. No? It studies the body parts. So the approach of anatomy in studying its object is to study its uh, it part by part or piece by piece. And anatomy is uh, concerned with the observable or tangible things in front of him or her. And the anatomist is uh, concerned with the immediate and proximate result or answer no? uh, to his questions with regard to its, sub, uh, its object. But in terms of philosophy, the approach is not like that. Because philosophy uh, is not studying things piece by piece, but philosophy is offering uh, the ultimate explanation about reality. It is concerned with the significance of facts. It looks beyond. It is in the realm of the ideas rather than in the realm of the factual realities in this world. And then with regard to the concern about man, instead of focusing on the factual existence of man in this world, philosophy is more fascinated no, about the meaning of the human life. So that's how we can see the difference between physical sciences and philosophy. Well, by comparing, of course, we can more understand the, the subject matter that we are defining. In this case, philosophy. And then finally, this is the last uh, subtopic. Uh, and this is again a comparative approach. Uh, this is a comparison between philosophy and theology. Uh, I decided it to be the last one because it provides us a very meaningful uh, realization. So what makes uh, philosophy and uh, theology different from each other is that philosophy uses reason as its, as its tool for the attainment of its objective. Whereas theology is using faith so that it can achieve its uh, objective. Now, what makes philosophy and theology the same from each other is that they have the same objective, which is the truth. You get it? So if uh, theology has God as its main objective, philosophy may, may also have that objective because God is the truth. Alright? Now, the language of philosophy is different from the language of theology. Because here, the principle is to see is to believe. In philosophy, because it is a science, uh, we will only believe uh, if there are evidences that are in front of us. And we will not believe uh, if something is not supported by the evidences. That is philosophy at work. But in theology, the language and or the principle is, is 180 degrees or 360 degrees turn around. Or 180 degrees. I am confused. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, because uh, in theology, uh, the principle is to believe is to see. So, 
Now you understand that in 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 the realm of faith, believing goes ahead, and seeing only follows. Unlike in in reason, in in philosophy, it is seeing that goes ahead, and believing follows. So it is the other way around. That is why in theology, uh, we can hear people saying that if you have uh, that high level of faith, then uh, it is expected that you can see a lot of things that other ordinary people cannot see. No. So you believe so that you can see. Alright? So those arrows now, uh, which are symbolizing these two fields of studies, are also interesting. Well, that is mine all, only. No, It's me who... who who has the opinion that it should be this way so this arrow going down is symbolizing the nature of theology or faith so the arrow going down tells us that the process is so simple and it is effortless for theology to attain its objective which is the truth now what we need to do is simply sit down and made an ascent of our faith we only have to believe and then the truth is only already in us whereas in philosophy I consider this as effortful uh, symbolized by the arrow going up it is full of effort for us to to reach that understanding of the truth we have to exert a lot of effort using our arguments our human reason and that is actually what Thomas Aquinas did when he developed the the quinque vie no? the quinque vie or the five ways of proving the existence of God all right so as mentioned a while ago uh, at the middle of this uh, two fields of study is Thomas Aquinas because he is the great synthesizer he said to be uh, one of the he said to be the angelic doctor of the Catholic Church for uh, he uh, for uh, bringing to the world his famous work the Summa Theologiae no? a compendium of all of his philosophical and theological works combined all right so we are now at the end of our discussion in lesson two and i would like to share with you uh, these quotations that i got from uh, none other than pythagoras the one who coined the term philosophy and our very own socrates okay uh, socrates is uh, one of the great icons in the history of philosophy and I quote, A fool is known by his speech, and a wise man by his silence. F uh, fool people are talkative, but wise men are silent. They are deep. They seldom talk, and when they talk, you can be assured that they talk with sense. The only true wisdom is in knowing you know nothing. True wisdom comes from each of us when we realize how little we understand about life, ourselves, and the world around us. So this is coming from Socrates. You can remember that uh, uh, the concept of ignorance is associated with Socrates. He loves that. He loves to be considered ignorant because when he said he was ignorant, it is the time when he is telling us that we have to recognize that our human capacity to understand things is limited and therefore we have to have uh, we have to recognize that we have rooms for our improvement all right so these quotations from Pythagoras and Socrates remind us to seek for wisdom rather than simple intelligence little knowledge is dangerous as all of us know and the fool are are already contented to boast 
for the little knowledge that they know. Ignorance or knowing nothing for Socrates means that there is always a room for our improvement and that we should not stop seeking for wise understanding of the truth. All right? So until here for now, and thank you for listening. Good day.